Thanks, everyone. Um, so yeah, this, is, this presentation is about how Microsoft is attempting to disrupt education one living room at a time. How do we take what exists right now in terms of with what we think about learning and transform it into something that is not only different, but innovative and fun. Um, so a little bit about um, um, John and, and myself. Uh, I'm a former computer systems engineer. I've been a learning scientist. I uh, uh, did my degree at UW-Madison. I've been a faculty member at Michigan State University. And uh, I'm, uh, but, but I think the, the strands that, that have uh, kind of so across all my life have been to be a game designer and an educator first and foremost. I was doing games and learning back in 1995 when people were not even thinking about this stuff. And um, it, is, uh, it, it, has, it has been a great journey. And uh, here we have John Tynes, my, my colleague, it's video game and, and table, tabletop game designer extraordinaire. He didn't have a picture, even though he's a lot more handsome than I am. And uh, um, uh, he's also a, a, a great author and, and screenwriter. Um, so, what are we talking about today? Well, you know, the, the, the first thing that I would like to talk about is um, an article that I read in The uh, Economist a few weeks back that was talking about something that is called the Third Industrial Revolution. And this is important and relevant to what we're talking about today because what is happening, what happens in industry at the end of the day is going to end up driving a lot of what happens in the world of education. Uh, you know, at, during the First Industrial Revolution, you know, before we had the Industrial Revolution, most of, of the production and the, and the way of exchanging products was pretty bespoke. It was pretty much, you know, you traded with your neighbor, you traded very custom products, handmade, et cetera, et cetera. However, we discovered ways in which we could actually start scaling, in which we could actually start reproducing things. That happened with the mills, with the, with the clothing mills uh, uh, back in England, which led to the first really uh, uh, step into automating. Uh, the second step happened during the time of mass production. Henry Ford comes up with a way of creating the, the production line, and he comes up with this, uh, with this uh, statement that said, you know, now anybody can have a car of any color they want as long as it's black. And, and, and the, the, the funny thing is that that statement really summarizes things. We were able to produce things in mass and send them everywhere in the world. However, the sacrifice came with the ability to personalize things. However, technology is really dramatically transforming that. And one of the things that we're, we're getting to, and this is what, what the economists refer to with the third industrial revolution, is that technologies like 3D printing, nanotech, as well as things like Web 2.0 technologies are now allowing us to create a gamut of products in very, very short time with very, very low, low cost to entry. So once we, we get to this moment where anybody can actually start a company, and that doesn't mean that it's going to be successful, but once anybody can start producing, we can start making people producers, which is something that Jim G talked about this morning, uh, all of a sudden, the expectations for what it means to learn begin to transform really, really dramatically. The age, the industrial age, and the, the, the school system that we know today was created for that, for in, an industrial age where everything was about reproducing a pattern, reproducing a model. Very few people could be designers. It was something that was very, just, you know, reserved for, the, for a very, very few elite people that could be designers. And then everybody else essentially had to reproduce that stuff. Today, with the advent of these technologies, that's completely different. Anybody can be a designer, anybody can produce, anybody can create stuff. The expectations on learning have to change for that world. Uh, interestingly enough, the place where they have actually begun to change and where we're seeing innovation is actually not in the formal learning landscape. All of us and, and uh, most people here are you know, aware of the conversations that have been happening over the last 10 years about how schools are not changing and schools are late to adapt and, and how their structures are still functioning like they functioned you know, at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, in the informal learning landscape, however, things have begun to change in really, really significant ways and in really exciting ways. I see it in many ways as a dam, you know, the, the formal education system is a dam that is holding on to an old system that the informal education space is starting to crack holes all over the place. And eventually it's going to fall. And things, we have things like the semantic cloud that lets us aggregate content in, in pages like, you know, Wikipedia, How Stuff Works, Khan Academy, you name it. We also have things like peer-to-peer -peer communication, Skype, that allows a teacher to go and talk to a classroom miles and miles away and basically disseminate courses however they see fit at a very low cost. The third one is things like mobile technologies and, and, and scalable distribution models, where I can now go and create an app and distribute it to millions of people in one shot. For those of you who are familiar with Udacity, you know, where you actually have a college classroom that can hit 100,000 students 
you know, that's something that universities would beg to get 100,000 students at one time to, to, to enroll in a class. And of course, crowdsourcing and crowdfunding that are completely disrupting the way that we think about how to give sustainability to these models. So what is Microsoft doing in this space? Well, the, you know, uh, our approach to it is, is something I would call the, the Xbox Connect approach to, to, to learning. And that means that our strategy really starts with disrupting the way that people consume media. And the reason why we decided to do this is because if you think about the learning life of a person throughout a lifetime, even if you do a PhD, only a small fraction of your time is going to be spent in formal learning. The vast majority of your time is going to be spent in informal spaces. And the amount of media that we consume today is shaping far more the way that we think and the way that we learn than most other things that we consider learning. So the way that we're doing it is we're saying, can we bring interactivity to disrupt things like television, like books, and like games? And today, we're going to focus particularly on television, because we think it's one of the most exciting proposals that, that, uh, that, this, that this strategy brings. Um, so the, 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 one of the most exciting things that we've been working on over the last few years is this idea of two-way TV. And the challenge that we had was, well, can existing TV, educational TV, uh, and, and its content be transformed into an accessible and yet immersive interactive experience? Can we take a show that people would normally watch passively and transform it into an experience that reinforces that learning using interactivity without breaking the experience? Our answer became Connect Sesame Street TV. And I'm going to let John talk a little bit about you know, the things that we've done with that, and then we'll, we'll, we'll tell you where you can find this, where you can actually experience this awesome product. So uh, as you can see, one of the big things we've been working on this last year and a half with the Sesame Street project is how to make games for preliterate toddlings. Little kids, they can't read, they can't use traditional menus or UI, they can't navigate deep content structures, the kind of things we expect from a, an older gamer or an adult, they have real challenges with. Um, with Connect Sesame Street TV, we wanted to take this experience of watching a library of TV shows, like, like a, on a DVD or something, right? And make that something that a kid could use, um, and then a kid could then dive into each episode using a mix of both existing video content from Sesame Street with kind of a layer of interactivity placed on top, as well as brand new contents, new sketches that we shot with Sesame Workshop, with the puppeteers, the actual puppets, uh, the whole thing. And doing that stuff is very custom interactive video. Um, full motion video gaming has had kind of a, a, a bad rap ever since the train wreck of the CD-ROM era. Uh, we had games like Sewer Shark and Night Trap that really gave that medium a black eye, uh, but we realized with Sesame Street that we really wanted to use the real puppets, real video, the real characters, the real voices, and so we went ahead and, and, and bit the bullet on that, and it paid off great. Um, when you see the game for yourself, I think you'll agree that having Elmo on screen talking to you and playing catch back and forth with Kinect is a very successful experience. Um, the key to us for doing a project like Sesame Street was Kinect. Uh, kids three years old, two years old even, we don't expect them to be able to use our, our controller with 22 different inputs and so forth, right? But with Connect, they can just kind of get up and do it. Um, to do that, we had to embrace a few kind of principles from the design side of things I want to talk about very briefly. One is that um, we, we don't want to rely on parents being in the room. Um, we need the kid to get through an entire episode end to end successfully. Um, in many cases, we're going to have parents who are putting the kid in front of the TV because they got stuff to do or whatever is busy at home. And if the kid is like, mom, mom, every five minutes, like they're not going to play it again. They're going to put a DVD in instead, right? We have to fight that. We have to actually be, be as easy to use as a DVD for the child. Um, and so we, we make sure the interfaces are appropriate for kids. Um, we ensure they can't get stuck. Uh, if they're unable to progress in an interactive segment, uh, we will eventually just kind of move it along for them and sort of solve the problem and keep going. Um, we also have to deal with what we're looking at as instant accessibility. Um, that the kid just needs to understand at a very you know, intuitive level what to do next. Um, and we did it with a lot of verbal cues from the, from the characters, you know, throw the ball to me or whatever, and then the kid does this or this or this or this or whatever. We take a wide variety of inputs. Um, one thing I want to touch on here briefly is that if you find yourself making games for little kids um, using Connect, uh, augmented reality plus physics equals awesome. Um, that is far and away the closest experience you can have to touch screens where my finger and the UI are entirely in sync. When I can see myself on screen with Kinect's RGB camera, 
I can be green screened out of my living room and placed into a virtual environment or whatever, but when the objects around me have natural physics properties and I just begin to move around and they react the way I expect them to do as a human being in this world of physics, uh, it's magical and it's, it's easy. It's so, it's so clear and straightforward. Um, kids, it turns out, unsurprisingly, love seeing themselves on TV. When they see themselves on TV and there are objects nearby they can interact with and they work as they should, it's really satisfying. In some cases, we try to actually have the, the physics sort of teach you what to do. We did a prototype, for example, of a uh, photograph selection mechanic where I can pick from a library of photographs of myself and my family or whatever. And to do that, we show the kid on screen and we drop photographs kind of slowly like falling leaves from the top. And as they tumble down, when the photo, if the kid is just standing still, when the photographs begin to hit the child's body, they start to bounce and tumble kind of slowly and gently. And if the kid is nothing at all, they realize these objects have physical properties and my body does too. And when they do that, then they raise their arms, they move around, things are bouncing off of them, they can catch them and play with them, they can stretch the photographs. And just the fact that the objects bounce off of you teaches you how you can interact with them. Um, that's the kind of accessibility we've been going for on the Sesame Street project. The last principle we've been trying to apply from a design perspective is that um, unlike a lot of games, we're way more interested in engagement than we are in skill mastery. Uh, in many games, it's about testing your skills, getting better at things, mastering things over time. Um, with Sesame Street and other educational TV shows traditionally, they, they try to drive you towards skill mastery through repetition of engagement. You watch the same episodes, you see multiple storylines about the letter A, numbers, and so forth. So to us, it's way more important that we have the child engaged and participating than it is that we are actually you know, like grilling them to be sure that they have mastered this thing before we move on to the next step. In video games, we usually try to ensure some kind of level of competence or mastery. Like we give you a new gun, we make you use it. When you succeed, great, now you can go on. Here's the boss to kill. We don't have bosses in Sesame Street. You know, we have engagements. Um, and as long as you're kind of like half-assedly, vaguely doing it with your two-year-old stubby arms, then we're very excited for you, and we will keep on moving very happily. So these things have been really critical to us, uh, and if you find yourself engaging in design for preliterate toddlings, which I hope you will, because it's great, it's really fun, um, keep this stuff in mind. It's very successful for us. Absolutely, and I think, I think one, of the, one of the big, um, uh, uh, we, we actually had several learnings coming out of the, of, of the creation of uh, Sesame Street that I think are worth a while sharing. So, you know, some of the key, key things, talking with Elmo is a really powerful experience. Being able to engage with a di in a dialogue with a TV character that you're familiar with is a really, really powerful experience because what that does is it drives an idea that Jim G has talked about a lot is called the projective identity. You putting yourself in the shoes of somebody that is enacting and is, that is affecting the show in a meaningful way. Second, it's beginning with fun and balancing learning is crucial, right? I mean, it, if, if the activity is not engaging, exactly what, what, what John is saying, if the activity is not something that a child would immediately jump to and start playing with, there's no point in us even talking about learning. In fact, when you actually look at the way that kids begin practicing and developing that, that cycle of mastery, it's precisely because they engage in things and do them over and over and over and over again. The other component is that there is an opportunity to go from co-viewing to co-participation. So as John said, if we create a lo very low touch experience where not only a child, but a parent with a child can jump in and jump out immediately without all the pain of having to navigate UIs and so on and so forth, a really magical moment is created. We found this out not only with Sesame, with another game that we were showing yesterday at the Kinect Lounge called Double Fine Happy Action Theater, where up to six people can jump in. There's magic in the moment of returning the living room into a social learning experience, into the social learning experience that it used to be and that it's still for many families, but that we've actually lost a lot with, with a lot of the indiv uh, individualization of technology. There's, there's uh, and, and, and then it also, the, the other component that we, that we found with this is that it requires rethinking assessment. What does it mean to assess an experience where what you learn is learned with your body? What does it mean to assess, to think about learning and about evidence of learning when you're actually enacting and engaging with your whole body? So all of a sudden we have an opportunity to really disrupt the way that we think of, you know, of, of, of testing somebody and to bring more of a performance and an, an embodied approach to that. So you know, in, in, in summary, I think we, you know, there are many things that we have learned with, with, uh, in, 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 the, in the last few years with designing 
things for uh, designing technology for Kinect. But I think the, the big thing is we have an opportunity to transform that living room into a powerful, playful learning space, right? Where play is the one that drives learning. And, and there are some key elements that I think transcend not only, you know, or, or transcend this talk that I've heard all over the conference this time around. Playful learning is embodied. It can, you know, the learning that happens with Kinect is always in reference to your body, and that allows it to be situated. It contextualizes the concepts and the experiences that you're trying to get by putting your body straight into the experience. It's also powerfully social. The moment that you bring more people to the play, that, power, that, that play becomes amplified and the learning becomes amplified. It's also expressive. The, to the degree that we can allow a player to to step into the role and to use their own expression, their own way of expressing themselves to participate in the play, we are creating, we're creating massive opportunities. And finally, it can be designed. It's not easy, but it can be designed. And once you design it, and once you consider very carefully who your audience is, and you execute that design, you get a really powerful, magical experience. So for those of you who actually want to see what this is all about, I encourage you to go to the, um, what is called the, the lounge where they have all the demos. There's a big screen right there and, and on top of one of the, of one of the uh, podiums where you can actually see and play Kinect Sesame Street TV. Thank you so much. I don't know if we have time for questions. Oh, okay, so we apparently have some time for questions. I tend to speak faster than I think I do. Anybody? Questions? Heckling? <laughs> Booze? Whistling? No? Yes? <laughs> yes, we actually incorporate it. So within, within, the, within the activities, and again, you can experience them there, we have activities that do incorporate feedback. So an example of an activity might be Cookie Monster comes and finds a tree, a tree that, drops that, a tree that basically drops all sorts of things when you jump. So you jump and you're looking for, a for words with a particular letter, the letter K. So you, you look for things like kumquat and kazoo and every time you jump, you actually get the immediate feedback of enacting, of taking action in the world. And that's where, that's what, what I was talking about, about assessment. What does it mean to assess and what does it mean to look at performance when you actually have that whole body language involved? There's an activity in the Sesame Street as well um, where it's kind of like a letter of the day moment. Um, and we're about to cheer, like, you know, what are the days coming out? Let's give it up for letter C. And you clap, right? Like, yay. Well, sometimes letter K comes out instead, or M or L or something. And if you don't clap, then the letter's like, oh, I'm sorry, I screwed up, and goes back away, right? And if you do clap, there's kind of a moment of like, K is awesome, but here's C, and then we'll kind of move along, right? But yeah. we, do, we do take that input and give that feedback where it makes sense. Yeah, so we have that cycle of feedback but we're also very conscious about how to provide that feedback to the learner, right, to the young learner. Because we don't want, one of the mistakes that I see made a lot in games and learning is that people don't consider their audience, don't consider the capabilities of their audience. And they think, well, everybody's a gamer, or they think, well, if you're not a gamer, you just simply, we'll, we'll put a very, you know, a very simplistic experience, or we'll turn it into a classroom. Those are the three angles that I see. And in reality, it's about balancing and understanding what the capabilities of your learner is, are you know, from a play perspective and from a learning perspective and so on. In, in the case of that letter of the day thing, um, when the wrong letter comes out, whether the kid claps or not, we make it clear that the mistake was the letter. Like the anthropomorphic letter is the one that screwed up, not the child. <laughs> so the, the kid is just like, ah, oh, ha, ha, stupid letter, go away, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, I think we're all, all right. set. Thank you so Thanks, much. Guys.